government has got to go, say. When the government said they were going to impose a contract last summer, the presidents of nine or ten world colleges of medicine wrote saying it was a real and immediate threat to the future of the NHS. Save our NHS! Save our NHS! Jeremy Hunt and the government have started talking about the contract being necessary in order to provide the seven-day NHS. We've seen that they haven't planned anything out, they haven't provided any funds, they don't know what seven-day services means, and they don't know how many more doctors and nurses and other NHS workers they need to provide it. And what's more, junior doctors are one group that already are working seven days a week for the NHS. <laughs> The NHS leaders have publicly stated that what they mean by seven-day service is a seven-day emergency service, which junior doctors are already providing. Now, we'd all like to see a better service. We all want to see a better uh, NHS, um, but it's got to be funded. In the past couple of years, a number of trusts that have gone into the red, as opposed to being financially relatively healthy, has increased exponentially. So there are cuts within the hospital. There's less staff. People are working harder. A minimum of 40 hours averaged a week. Most of us are probably on 56 since we opt out of the EU Working Time Directive. We know that we don't have to do that. There's no pressure from the hospitals to do it, but we do it because we're willing to. Most of us are working on rotas that aren't filled. We're having to make up the hours ourselves or the hospitals having to get in staff from agencies outside. When we're fully staffed, we just about manage, but as soon as anyone's off sick or there's a gap, then it makes things a lot more difficult. One of our concerns, our very big concerns about the new contract is we feel like the safeguards that are being put in place to prevent that overworking don't have the same robustness as the current ones do. The hospital would have financial penalty for doing that. Our concern is that that will make it easier to kind of ignore the rules and for hospitals to say no we need you to stay or need you to work these shifts and not that for there not to be any financial implications for them it's very difficult to say no if you're asked to work new contracts we say no jeremy hunt has got to go new contracts we say no jeremy hunt has got to go to get into medical school nowadays it's so competitive that you need to be working on your cv from your maybe 13 14 years old which is so young. Um, you know, you work hard at school, you get the grades, you go to medical school whenever you're 18, 19, you work really hard for five years, six years, and then as a 23 or 24 year old, you get a job that has a lot of responsibility, and then your postgraduate exams, the hardest exams of your life, which you do while working a full time rota and you're paying for those yourself. It makes me very sad, but it also makes me very angry whenever, people, whenever it, it, I feel it. It's insinuated that I might be lazy or greedy in some way because um, I, I think that most of us really have dedicated our lives to this. It's not about the overall amount of money that junior doctors get paid. Our union, the BMA, have said we've accepted that we won't get paid any more on average. We're just saying that the money should be divided up at different times of the week in different ways. And, there's, and we've actually, our proposals, as I understand it, have actually been that our basic pay is reduced, not increased, but reduced so we can properly uh, fund and, and, and uh, people to work weekends and nights um, when we really need people to be working. So we, we want to work with the government in order to put a contract in place that helps us get the staff that we need and retain the staff to keep the NHS running. Um, a third of a &E doctors have emigrated or left medicine in the last five years. Almost everyone you speak to has at least considered changing careers or um, changing countries so that um, they can perhaps get some better working conditions. So I think the, gr the greatest thing that I find has changed is morale. And generally I think it's, it's very low at the minute. It's often quite hard to go into work and remain upbeat for patients. The population's growing, population's getting older, um, and that means that the population's also getting sicker, so there's higher demand than ever on the NHS in general. Really major problem is cuts in social services and care. So people end up staying in hospital longer than they need to medically because they're waiting for the appropriate care package at home or a nursing home placement. That means we've got fewer beds free to admit patients and it slows things up in A&E and it has a really big, quite a really big impact. Um, and also 
people finding it more difficult to get a GP appointment might mean they come to a &E for something um, and a lot of problems with um, support for people with mental health problems so all the impacts of changes to benefits changes to support services in the community I mean people are more likely to have a crisis more likely to need inpatient help and that definitely increases the pressure We're seeing private companies come in and run GP practices. We've seen a private company try and run a hospital in Cambridgeshire Circle and they, they, they bailed after a year or something. It's this broken apart, loads of different providers not communicating with each other, using different systems, it's really dangerous. That's psychiatry, that's, that's the physical health side. You, you've got 10 yards between them, but already there are difficulties in terms of the communication and we're, we're mates and colleagues, but there will always be problems. Can you imagine another 10 different providers within the hospital, four or five different providers? You, you are asking for, for things to drop as people move between services. It's so, so dangerous, it really is. And the private sector takes the things easiest to deliver and can provide them with the most immediate ready cash. We end up doing the complex operations and we end up looking as though we've got worse outcomes in the NHS. They can then use it to say the NHS isn't working, Therefore, we need to break it up and sell it off. If you take the example of drug and alcohol services, all gone to the private sector. The private sector puts in a pitch going, we'll provide that service, but when they pitch for that, so they go, this is how much it will cost to provide that service, they don't include training up doctors. Whereas the NHS also skills up the next generation. It's a, it's a complete network and it's holistic and, it, and it's sustainable. Continuity of care is so important for patients. Seeing the same people, getting care that carries on, that won't happen. Who's NHS? Our NHS! Who's If, as the government is saying, we are the fifth biggest economy in the world, then it's a travesty that we are not funding our health service. We spend less per head on health care than France, Germany, Denmark, Belgium, Sweden, the States, Canada, New Zealand, and yet we provide decent health care. Now, if we're not providing de decent health care, further squeezing the NHS and reducing the funds is not going to help us provide better health care. And if we are providing good and decent health care, as I believe we are, then the NHS is already incredibly efficient. You can't have it both ways. The most common lie peddled is we can't afford it. I absolutely hate it, it makes my blood boil. You will pay for it one way or the other. You'll just pay for it through health insurance and other means. So it's not a question of we can't afford it. What we need to do is think about how it's paid for. It's bad enough being ill without not being, being terrified that you'll then have to remortgage your house or take your spouse will have to take on an extra job. That's not what should happen just because you've got diabetes. They said the NHS was safe and sold bits to their buddies. They've sold off schools and hospitals, trains and their own souls. Don't trust them, Tory liars. Don't trust them. They'll say anything for power, Tories. Lie, 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 Every day we're out on strike, people come up and say, we support you, can I sign your petition? What can I do? And it's the same with other healthcare workers. We've had fantastic amounts of support, and that really helps. It's so important that we continue this, because our genuine feeling is that we're the, we're the first line of attack and we feel that, that there will be reforms and cuts in nursing staff, other allied healthcare professionals um, and their contracts and of course we know that the consultant contracts are being negotiated at the minute and the negotiations are potentially quite fractious so we really feel that there's a, a burden of responsibility on our shoulders to stand up to this. The threat of the strike was the only thing that got the government to the negotiating table. This contract offer now in position has changed dramatically as a result of the industrial actions we've had. The the only thing this government listens to is industrial action. Long, long before I'm a doctor, I'm a patient. And I'm out here striking as much as a patient as a doctor to try and fight for an NHS. The NHS has saved my life. I went in one day from being a doctor to a patient because of a car smash. It saved my life. And I want it to be there for my children, for my family and for the future. Who's NHS? Your NHS! Who's NHS? Your NHS! Who's NHS? Your NHS!